Hi, I wanted to bring you a Bible study. I know I've been doing them uh, once a week and everything, and I wanted to pick up here. Um, today's message, it coincides with a poem that I also um, released earlier this week. So if you haven't heard the poem, I encourage you to hear the poem. I believe it will uh, encourage you and um, prayerfully let you know something the Lord put on my spirit this week uh, just to share with you. So, uh, in going with the message, this message is entitled Trust in Him, and it's based on the book Ecclesiasticus, and that's chapter 2. So, if you want to read along, you'll find it in the Apocrypha books. So, if you don't have a Bible that has the complete um, sections, then you might have to pull it from there. Or you can also Google this, because Ecclesiasticus is on Google. Uh -huh. And there's plenty of apps that have the whole Bible, and it does include Ecclesiasticus as well. So, without further ado, Father, we'd like to just thank you for the ability to be able to come to you and to just study your word, study your will, see what you have to say for your children in this time. I know right now is a precarious time for many of us as church is not as usual. It has turned into something quite interesting, something very alive. And Lord, we just thank you for doing what you're doing in this season. And we just pray that your children have an ear to hear you. And no other will they hear. And that you bless them. And that you uh, release to them what you will have for them to hear in this season. In Yeshua's name, hallelujah. So, so in verse 1, one thing I want everyone to know is when you decide to give your life to Christ or the Messiah, Yahshua, a.k.a. for many of you might call him Jesus, um... It requires something from you. And really, when you when you give your life to Christ, it's not even... I want to make sure I, you understand what that means. Because when we give our lives to Christ, or when we um, confess and all these things that you know many of us have been taught in church, I want you to understand what you're really doing, which is really committing to the Word of the Most High. So you're committing your life to the Most High. You're not committing your life to a fictional character named Jesus. Um, you're committing your life to the Word, which was wrapped in flesh by the Most High. And that is, um, you know, the interpretation of what we call, or what we're really referencing when we're talking about Yahshua or Jesus. We're not referencing some, you know, uh, character completely disassociated with the Most High. It's really His words being born into flesh. So I just want to make sure you understand that. Um, and when you do, you understand that there is no separation between, um, you know, the Father, His Word, as far as, you know, how we're supposed to understand it. But what I want you to understand, even in this here, I know that's probably, if it's too much, always DM me and I can explain it more. But um, when you commit your life, you know, to follow the Most High, Yahweh or Yehoahweh, depending on how you prefer to pronounce His name, a.k.a. for many, call Him God, uh, but when you do, the Bible says here in verse 1, it says that, My son, if thou commit to serve Yehoah, prepare thy soul for temptation. You know, and, and I think a lot of people think when you give your life to Christ or when you say you're going to start following the Father and not follow yourself or flesh or whatever, that it's just going to be this cakewalk, this great experience. And many don't realize that in following the most high, you are really stepping into a war zone. You're really stepping into a spiritual battlefield, whether you realize it or not, because your soul will be tempted, you know, by the enemy, and every facet of your being will be questioned. Your your thinking, your emotions, your your feelings, your um, your ideas, all of these things will be confronted by your your adversary, you know, the one that wants to come against you and drive a wedge between what you believe and and what you are now committing your life to. And um, something I wrote down is, yes, when the light of the Most High shines through you, you become a light, you become a beacon. And because you become a beacon of the light, because the Word is supposed to, His Spirit is supposed to dwell within you, we're supposed to be living vessels that, you know, breathe, you know, and speak the Word and be like Him. We're supposed to be holy because He's holy. And so we're His representatives on earth, and that's what Christ was. He was an example. He was the Word made into flesh to be a living example that can teach and, and, and touch us and kiss us and hold us when He was physically here. Now, you know, those 
those words are comforting. They're, they're proof that we can do it because what is impossible with man is possible through Christ, which is possible through the word, which strengthens us. So I just want to encourage you with that. And because you are a light in a dark and dim and dull world, it's not hard for the enemy to see you when you decide to commit your life because you shine because you ain't got no choice. That's what the light of the world does. And that's what the most high does that's what the word does is it shines a light on darkness evil wickedness and of course it's going to react <laughs> turn a light on to see what happens so what i love too in verse 15 through 17 it explains the condition for which we are making a commitment some people might say well how do i know if i really committed my life to the most high and i want to read this to you because this is outlining the type of commitment we have to be making or we're making when we say okay father we're going to serve you over everything else it says they that fear Yahweh will not disobey his word and they that love him will keep his ways they that fear Yehovah will seek that which is well, pleasing unto him, and they that love him shall be filled with the Torah. They that fear Yahweh will prepare their hearts and humble their souls in his sight, saying, We will fall into the hands of Yehovah and not into the hands of men. For as his majesty is, so is his mercy. And what I want to point out with this is, is, is actually a few things. Because... When, when we're looking at this, we have to understand what we're committing, you know, and then what does fear and reverence and how these things coincide with each other. And there are a couple of other verses in the same chapter that references, um, you know, the fear of the Lord and why and what it is and all that stuff. And I'm going to get to that in just one second. But what I really want us to um, pay attention to here, because it coincides with verse 2 as well, and it says... Um, they that fear Yahweh will seek that which is well pleasing unto him, and they that love him shall be filled with the Torah. They that fear Yahweh will prepare their hearts. And preparing your heart is a really interesting thing because in the Bible we read and we can study that the Bible says that, you know, a man's heart is eternally wicked and no man can really know it except for the Father who looks upon the hearts of man and he knows it. And so, you know, the question is how do we prepare our hearts? How do we know if we're really committed? How do we know if we're not just saying vain words? How do we know if we're not just reciting something out of Romans or something that somebody told us to say for salvation when in fact we're not committed to to what the word says we're not committed to giving up what's in our hearts we're not committed to releasing the things that we love if they're evil or or otherwise if they're contrary to the father and it says and humble their souls in his sight you know humbling yourself humbling your desires how many of us are willing to even put down our desire for netflix let alone you know food or, or relationships or, or spirituality or whatever it is you got going on you know are we really willing to humble ourselves and say you know what father maybe the things i feel are not the way i should feel maybe the things i look how i look at life should not be the way i look at life maybe some of the experiences i've had in life have shaped me in a way that i really should not be shaped but because i'm here now i feel like this is who i am but see when you commit yourself to the father you have to be willing to count it all as done as paul did he says i counted everything i've I am everything I was, everything I could be, everything I should be. I count it all as nothing because I got to realign myself. I got to humble myself and say, Lord, what do I really know about me? What do I really know about my purpose? What do I really know about my destiny? What do I really know about my husband? Or, or if, you, you know, if you're a man, what do I really know about my wife? What do I really know about anything? You know, compared to what I was taught. And what if what I was taught wasn't even right? What if it doesn't line up with the word? How do I know how to really fear and reverence you if I don't even know how to fear and reverence those that I should? What if I did have a terrible parent? What if I did get raised by somebody else? What if I did come from a humble beginning? What if I did come from the streets? What if I came from, you know, riches and I don't know how to, I don't have to be a respecter of person. People respect me. I don't have to earn it because I already have. Somebody else paid the price. So I'm just walking in there and their blessings you know how do i really learn to humble myself how do i get that i love what it says in ecclesiastes at the end it says the beginning of all wisdom is to fear the most high or to fear the lord to feel the you know yahweh and to 
and and that is really where the beginning of wisdom begins and chapter one of ecclesiastics is all about ecclesiasticus excuse me it's all about wisdom and i encourage you to read that chapter as well because it does set up the foundation for understanding how wisdom works and um later on in this same book it's another it's some more stuff about wisdom which i will share because i think it's more specific and easier to translate um in something as short as these bible studies um, but what I want to bring up now is 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 verse two, and I want to show you how um, you know preparing your heart. It says, "Set thy heart aright, and constantly endure, and make no haste in time of trouble." And what I in in, in verse three is 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 can continue it too. It says, "Cleave unto him, and depart not away, that thou mayest be increased at the last end." And what I want you to remind you, or the word that really sticks out, is endurance. You know, the Bible talks about in, you know, in Isaiah and in the New Testament and many places that those that endure until the end will receive the prize. You see, it's not enough to just go to church on a day or to or just watch a TV program and say, Lord, I commit my life and I, I will serve you all the days of my life. And you are the head of my life. You are my Lord and Savior and all that good stuff. However you choose to do it, it doesn't. The words don't matter if your heart, your mind, your soul is not committed and your actions don't follow. Meaning, if you don't endure until the end, then you don't have the prize. People say once saved, always saved. That's a cliche. That's not true. You can choose to, you know, take an oath of salvation and then the rest of your life live completely contrary. And that is not consistent with the word and it will not get you into heaven. People who live in in direct contrast, the Bible talks about iniquity. Iniquity is living in sin and enjoying it and choosing that lifestyle over one of righteousness and holiness. And that is not going to get you into the pearly gates. That's why in the New Testament it says that everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is not going to make it into heaven. And he's going to say, get away from me, you worker of iniquity. Because you did not endure until the end. You did not cleave unto the Most High. It says, and do not depart. You departed at some point. At some point, you decided something you loved was more important than the way that the Father told you to live. I love something that I heard um, Dr. Turner say, and he said, his will, his word, his way. And I just feel like those three W's are really how I now, you know, encourage people to live their lives and to understand his 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 word and how it works because it really has to be his word his will and his way because if it's not it's just not going to work you're not going to be able to go into his banquet without his permission you're not going to be able to get into his heaven without his permission you're not going to be able to make it into his eternity and be in his presence without his permission people think that they are going to be able to just waltz into wherever they want to go because they feel like they are entitled to do so well the father does not have to respect you he did he's, he's a respecter of the persons he chooses he doesn't have to do that for you he doesn't have to do that for the world he doesn't have to do that for society he has his will his word his way and so if you're willing and you want to make it into what he has then you must do it his way and that's just the way that that works and i love what it also says in verses four and five it says whatsoever is brought upon thee take cheerfully and be patient when thou art changed to a low state it didn't say if you are changed to a low state it says when you are changed to a low state because yes everybody it rains on the just as well as the unjust there are good days for everybody and not so good days for everybody it's just the way of it's, it's just the way that i don't necessarily want to say just the way of the world but it's just the way that humanity is set up you know that it rains on the just as well as the unjust it's the system that we're in it's it's the way that life works and, and for people to think because they committed their lives to the Most High that they'll never have any adversity is completely untrue. And I love what it says in verse 5 because it further validates the concept of we all have to go through a test of trial and even pain sometimes. And it says, for gold is tried in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of adversity. So if you don't go through any adversity, what are you going to preach about? What are you going to teach about? What are you going to tell people about? You don't really have much to go on. You don't have much to talk about because you ain't been through nothing. You ain't you ain't got through nothing. Your endurance didn't take you nowhere. You know, if you start college and say, wow, this is just really too hard and you quit day one, you ain't learned nothing. 
if you go to culinary school say oh i quit this you ain't learn nothing if you constantly continue to start and stop and quit and start something over again start something new all the time you're not learning anything you're just starting and stopping and going in circles and you're living in a maze so this is part one i'm going to stop it here and then i'm going to do part two i'm dr crystal lee aka author k lee if you get lost you can find me on instagram facebook all the social media at author k lee